turn off your video now. Here we go. Uh, all right. Um, tonight we have the honor of having Matthew Hodgson here, the driving force behind Matrix. Uh, Matthew has a degree in computer science and physics and has worked on all sorts of communication projects for the past, well, say two decades. Um, mostly things with IRC, IMAP, RTMP, uh, SIP, and XMPP. Um, most of that was uh, proprietary software for uh, commercial enterprises. Um, but in 2014, he started uh, Matrix.org with uh, Amandine Lepap to develop Matrix, uh, open source protocol and framework to, uh, well, basically uh, bind most of all those uh, online communications together. Much like the One Ring. So, uh, Tolkien fan. Indeed. And uh, tonight he's going to tell us about uh, what Matrix is, why it's going to be huge, and what we can expect in the future. So with, uh, with all due respect, um, Matthew, the word to you. Well, well, thank you very much, Hans, and thank you for inviting me to come and talk. Um, I, I have a feeling that I was meant to talk perhaps um, a, a while back, um, but it fell through the cracks, but I'm very happy, um, even despite um, COVID times, to be able to meet and talk to everybody. I wish it was in person. I wish we had real pizza and beer, but instead um, it's either virtual or self-provided. Um, so. Uh, I, I, I'm the technical lead for Matrix as the, the open source project for decentralized communication. Um, perhaps it might make a little bit of sense um, to introduce myself a bit more beyond that, perhaps. Um, so particularly in the context of the Unix users group, just before we started recording, um, I was chatting with people and explaining that I actually um, have quite a lot of um, past of messing around with Unix machines over the years. Um, my personal hobby has always been silicon graphics uh, machines, and this began when I was very young, um, in the early 80s, um, which I guess dates me either for the best or worse, when my father, who was working for a defense company at the time, brought home three computers. And these things were silicon graphics, um, Iris workstations, to be precise, Iris 1400 workstations. And the year must have been about 1983 or so. And I was just old enough to be playing with computers at the time. And these things were big. They were like half height racks and desk side um, workstation machines with Motorola 68,010 processors running at, I think, 8 megahertz and about 32 megabytes of RAM. They came with um, 70 megabytes, um, five and a quarter inch full height um, hard disks made by a company called Ver Vertex, long since gone after they failed to produce reliable hard disks. And long story short, these things were the 148th, 9th, and 150th machines that Silicon Graphics ever made. So incredibly early um, generation kit. And they are what I learned to program on. They had C, they had Iris GL, the predecessor to OpenGL. They had ANSI C. They, uh, one of them had a TCP stack. The other two were using Xerox network stack, which again gives you an idea of the vintage and I had a lot of fun learning how to system in Unix and develop graphic stuff on these things. Fast forward a couple of decades, I was at university, and at that point, I was very obsessed with Usenet. And it was the point where Deja News went bust, and the Usenet newsgroup archive was orphaned, and it was before Google picked it up as um, Google Groups. And I got a copy of a lot of the archives there and decided to build a search engine and a web-based br browser um, to kind of replace Deja News. Uh, I called it Silicon Archive. I've still got the domain somewhere. I've still got the code somewhere. It ran on a bunch of Sun Spark stations, um, which was all I had for Kit at the time. And it was a lot of fun writing this conversation archiving system, going and putting a UI on Usenet. And obviously got, uh, wanted to do it in a threaded look and feel and imported lots of archives into it, did the search and started to think about what a universal kind of conversation architecture could look like. No, what if you could do better things than Usenet, as impossible as that might sound? What if you could do more real-time communication than Usenet, but still have the open or relatively open networking federation that you get with NNTP and the kind of rich community and the crazy times that you get on newsgroups? And um, there are two punchlines to this. Um, 
one of which is that it went live, but it was no longer big enough to fit on my crappy little Spark Station 2, I think it was. And um, at the time, Stephen Hawking was at University of Cambridge running the, or in, in residence at the Department of Applied Maths and Theoretical Physics. And he had a supercomputer made by Silicon Graphics called Cosmos, which I think was about eight racks worth of Origin 2000 um, in a great big mesh, 512 processors, um, gigabytes and gigabytes of RAM, quite a nice piece of kit. And um, the system in there took pity on me and was generous enough to let me host siliconarchive.net on it for about six months. And so I had a very surreal time going and playing around with this supercomputer or a segment of it or partition or whatever you call it, um, going and running this um, news group archive. That, and by the way, this wasn't for binaries or anything. This was almost trying to guess at the old, old archives, particularly the ancient silicon graphics ones from the early 80s and even late 70s for some of the Stanford precursor to silicon graphics stuff. And um, at the same time, Google launched Google Groups and I gave up because it, competing against Google didn't seem like much fun. And plus I'd left university and I was no longer allowed to freeload on this big SGI um, complex. Now, the reason for saying all of this is that I got the bug then um, for open communication and started to obsess about what a better communication fabric would look like than email or NNTP. And Matrix is very much the result of finally getting around to playing with those ideas. And it took me like 15 years to actually have the opportunity to do it. Um, but Matrix, sure enough, came around. And as you probably know, we're an open network for secure, decentralized, real-time communication. So in some ways, this is an NTP on steroids, and it does share a lot of architectural similarities, other than the fact that you can use it for any kind of structured data, anything that can be expressed as JSON, so any kind of object, basically. And that could be for chat, it could be for VoIP signaling, it could be open communication within VR or AR, it could be for real-time IoT, um, exchange if you have some stream of telemetry or um, other structured data that you want to throw around the place. Matrix is just going to be the missing communication layer for the web. Um, Tim Berners-Lee you know, wanted the web to have this real-time comms in it from the outset. And I think the web was too successful. It kind of it grew too quickly too early on because it was to write HTML. And rather than being a read, write, real time thing, it just became, it became throw up a web page with a web browser and oh, look, we can do web apps. Really progress much beyond that, to be honest. Whereas the idea was that you would be able to have a consistent way to publish in real time and consume, and it would be this great big pub sub network, and it just didn't happen. So Matrix is trying to fix that. Activity Pub is obviously trying to fix it too. Um, we have more of an emphasis, though, on chat and replicating conversation history, whereas we think of Activity Pub as being a bit more like RSS on steroids. So the mission is to create this global encrypted comms network that gives everybody an open platform for real-time comms. And you can think of it as being the glue which sits between various silos that exist today. They could be open networks like XMPP or Jabber and IRC. Um, it could be silos like Slack or Telegram or Discord. And most interestingly, it could be someone like Gitter, um, who is now bridged natively into Matrix. Hopefully, we'll be launching it next week. Um, but um, the uh, Gitter team have been focused on building a dedicated uh, native matrix bridge that means that you can access anybody in matrix um, natively from getter and vice versa so properly kind of building it into the wider network the blue dots in the middle are servers and conversations get replicated between them the green dots are make native matrix clients like element used to be called riot but there are many other ones as well and then these blue things assuming you can see my mouse can you i can't see from my own screen share you, okay, well, basically, um, the light blue things are bridges through to um, XMPP or Gitter or Slack, and they, they behave a bit like clients on um, uh, with superpowers, uh, a bit like IRC services on an IRC network are basically fake clients who can do magic things. Likewise, application services and matrix are fake clients, which can impersonate other clients and do magic things like 
masquerade the entirety of Slack into Matrix or masquerade an IRC network into Matrix 2. Um, any questions? This is making sense. Please do jump in with any um, uh, interruptions. It's much more fun than me just monologuing for hours. You might also need to. How long do I have, by the way? I've been going for 10 minutes. I can talk for hours, so really warn me. Hours sounds fine, but uh, the official time is uh, set at about 45 minutes. Okay, that, that's presentation. Fine. And then we have uh, been to 45 minutes discussion or questions. But if you want to mix it, you can just make it hours. <laughs> uh, I'll set to 45 minutes. Um, feel free to jump in with questions as we go. If not, we can have questions at the end. So in terms of the semantics of matrix, um, one of the big unique things is that no single party own your conversations here. That if I'm on my matrix server, I'm running one on a little Linux box down there, for instance, my personal one, um, and I send a message to somebody else and they are on a different server, the messages get replicated between them. It's very, very similar to Git architecturally in that there is no single focal point like a XMPP mark or a, I don't know, a centralized service like Slack or Gram. Instead, um, each server maintains a directed acyclic graph of messages as a signed data structure, very similar to a Git um, source tree. And the core of Matrix is how you replicate these data structures between the nodes with eventual consistency and Byzantine fault tolerance, such that if one of the servers in the room starts trying to do nasty things, like kick you or um, hijack the room, claim they have ops when they don't have ops, or flood it with messages, then the room is protected from bad actors participating in it. Because Matrix is a single global network, like um, email, rather than a private federation like an IRC network, you have to not trust anybody and be fault tolerant to any Byzantine attacker. As a result, the conversations are shared across everybody. I mean, you can almost think of it as um, subversive decentralization because I cannot send a message to somebody without sharing equal ownership of that message with them. So it's a big, big, big shift from the centralized systems, which we have become too used to these days with WhatsApp and Facebook, et cetera. So from a architectural perspective, um, there's, here's a block diagram showing you the things that you get in Matrix today. The main thing is the Matrix spec itself in the middle. And this is a whole set of Swagger API and um, uh, JSON schema event defini or definitions of the APIs that make up Matrix. We express them as JSON over HTTP but it's really important to understand that it is not HTTP specific. You can use any transport you like um, as long as it has some kind of RPC semantics. So we've done matrix over co-op, for instance, using Seabor as a, trans as a um, encoding rather than JSON. Um, we also use Quick and HTTP 2 and 3. Um, there are people experimenting with other more efficient or less efficient encodings and transports too. And the spec basically defines um, APIs for how clients talk to servers and how servers talk to servers, um, how application services um, talk to servers, how identity is managed, and how push works. So those are the five main APIs you get. And on this diagram, you can see the stacks of the open source components we provide. On the left-hand side on the top, you have JavaScript, um, and the web um, stack. So you have a JS SDK that wraps the um, HTTP API. Then you have a React SDK written in TypeScript on top of that, which provides UI components. And then you have an app like Element that builds on the React SDK to make to wrap it up into an actual app. Likewise, on iOS, you have an iOS SDK and um, Matrix Kit, which is the reusable UI components, and then I Element iOS on top. And then on Android, today's we have it all in Kotlin rather than Java. And we have the low level that wraps the um, API, then UI components, and then the app itself. Meanwhile, on the server side, we ship Synapse, which is a Python implementation of a matrix server. It's our reference implementation, and it's the original one. Um, it started off as a proof of concept and then a kind of prototype, and then we stupidly launched it. And as a result, here we are six years later, and there are 
hundreds of thousands of these deployed out there, <laughs> despite the fact that it was a prototype that got into the wild. The good news is that it has improved a lot over the years, and particularly in the last year since we exited beta um, um, in last summer. Um, although historically, it used to be quite painful. And I apologize to anybody who ran it um, in the past when it would be um, uh, quite resource intensive. I mean, it's still pretty resource intensive, but it's a lot more predictable and production grade, uh, whereas it was quite spiky in the past. Then you have Dendrite, which is our new generation server written in Golang, which um, en entered beta about a month ago. So it's pretty new. Um, it's had a bit of a wobbly life in that it started off um, in 2017, and we expected it to replace Synapse, except it kind of suffered second syndrome syndrome, second system syndrome, in that it um, didn't evolve fast enough to replace Synapse. And so we had to focus everybody on Synapse. And then we came back to it after a gap of about two years to finish it off. So that's what we've just done. Um, it's very similar to Synapse, except it uses 10 times less resources because we actually built it to be resource efficient, unlike Synapse. And it also scales horizontally on all components. And I'll talk a bit about it in a few. Then finally, as the matrix.org um, foundation, we provide application services and bridges to all sorts of different protocols like IRC and XMPP and Slack and Gitter and everything else. So all the green stuff here, um, all the solid green stuff is done by the matrix.org foundation that is a uk non-profit that we set up in order to look after the protocol and specifically to evolve the specification with an open governance model a little bit like um a rfc process we call them mscs matrix spec changes and we have a very very um extensive governance process to try to keep the protocol going in the right direction and to make sure that no evil commercial people hijack it and sabotage it for their um, nefarious commercial activities. Um, then we have also Element as a for-profit evil nefarious startup um, which is going and building the, uh, a glossy matrix client in the form of Element. Uh, we set up Element really to fund matrix development and to help bootstrap the ecosystem. Something that XMPP never really had, for instance, was a really good killer app. There wasn't like the obvious XMPP client everybody should use, which you know will just work and has all the latest features and will work with the right servers, et cetera. I guess you did very early on, but after Cisco acquired Jabber Inc., it's been a bit of a mess there. So. We wanted to create Element to avoid that same um, problem. And all of this stuff is released as Apache licensed open source, including Element. But it's important to note there are well, many, many different companies building on top of Matrix. One of them is Element. And then there are lots of other projects and companies too. Talking of which, all the purple stuff is stuff from the community. On the server side, we have Conduit written in Rust, new generation home server that is very, very exciting. Um, it doesn't federate that reliably yet, but its performance on unfederated rooms is ludicrously fast, like 30 times faster than Synapse. Um, and it does this by using a database called SLED that is a B-tree implementation. Um, so it's a NoSQL kind of approach, but with well-constructed NoSQL databases underneath it, it feels a bit like building it on BDB, but no, for this century rather than good old BDB from back in the day. And um, so really exciting to see that from the community. There's nobody from the core matrix team or element in it. It's done entirely by um, some folks um, based out of Germany. And then there are other servers too. There's one in C++ called Constra. There's one in Scala called Mascarene. And it's worth noting that matrix is very asymmetrical. The servers are hard. It's like building a database. Anybody can write a database client. Like I used to maintain a MySQL client back in the day, um, but a database is, is chunky. And Matrix is basically a big global real-time distributed database that anybody can participate in. So you can build the servers, but you know it's going to be at least a man year or two or three of effort. Whereas writing a Matrix client is like five lines of bash. I literally wrote one in five lines of bash because it's one hit to send a message, one hit to receive a message and you use curl to do the hit, and you put it in a while loop, and that's about it for writing your simplest possible matrix client. 
Um, lots and lots of bridges out there and bots and integrations provided by the community. Um, and also lots of clients, because as I said, they're pretty easy to write. Thunderbird has got first class matrix support landing um, sometime soon. We've got native Mac OS clients. We've got WeChat plugins written in both Python and Rust. We have a GTK plus um, Rust um, app called Fractal that's looking quite promising. There's a Qt and C++ one called Quaternion and hundreds of others. Um, there's um, basically, you know, there's one for a Nintendo 3DS, for instance, very important day-to-day -day platform. Um, there's uh, oh, ones for ESP8266 or whatever those little um, embedded um, um, processes are. Because in the end, it's just an HTTP hit to send and an HTTP hit to receive, you can do it anywhere. So I've already spoken about the architecture here. Um, but worth reiterating that you have the mesh of servers, clients connect to servers, application servers connect to the servers as well. And then identity servers are a bit of a murky bit where we map email addresses and phone numbers to matrix IDs to make it easier to discover people on the network. At the moment, these are logically centralized and it's a huge pain for us and we want to kill them because they cause more problems and questions than they solve, frankly. What do you get? Obviously, you get conversation history, you get group messaging, end-to-end -end encryption by default, and I haven't spoken about that, but we have spent huge amounts of effort taking the signal end-to-end -end encryption and making it work, hopefully, in a decentralized environment, and also adding on lots of bells and whistles um, to it for um, verifying identity via QR codes and emoji comparison, so you actually know who you're talking to, and also making it scale up um, by default, Signal and WhatsApp, I think, uses about 255 devices per conversation work maximum, whereas on Matrix, we can go up to about five, ten thousand, 10,000, um, depending on how fast your device is, in order to set up all of those um, encrypted channels. And uh, we also got it publicly audited, uh, funded by the Open Tech Fund. And also, I should mention, some of the E2E work we've done has been funded by NLNet, um, so thanks to anybody out here from NLNet. Um, we get VoIP signaling using WebRTC for the actual media, but Matrix for the signaling itself. And we get server notifications, server-side search, read receipts, typing notifications, presence. Synchronized read state and unread counts is surprisingly hard, as in it's something we added relatively late, and we thought, how hard can it be to tell you how many unread messages you have? And it turns out that Everybody has a different definition of unread. All their clients have got different push notification rules. And every time you send a message, you need to look at everybody who could have possibly said and seen that message, execute their push notifications, push them if needed, and calculate the unread things. And before you know it, you've basically created a system that starts to smell a bit, little bit like a kind of packet filtering system um, or like BPF or whatever. Um, the that um, VM you get in the Linux kernel these days for doing packet filtering and that needs to, that you basically created a mini language for executing push rules that has to be run every time the message goes anywhere. So surprisingly hard problem to solve. Then we get a decentralized content repository and account data which allows users to store arbitrary data per room. Terms of uptake for matrix, um, the total number of Matrix IDs um, has just topped 25 million um, in the last couple of weeks. And you can see the last three years or so of growth going from about a million at the, in the middle of 2017, then going for a kind of linear regime, which has slowly ramped up as more people have jumped on the network. And this is literally select distinct matrix ID from all the servers out there, which phone home to us. And when you install Synapse, it has an option saying, please, can you phone home stat so Matthew can show graphs like this at user groups, at meetups. And this is what happens to the data. Um, other stats, we, we see about 6 million messages a day on the matrix.org um, server. There are about 7 million rooms active, uh, 55,000 servers that we can see out there. On matrix.org, we see about 40 messages coming in and about 4,000 is going out at um, uh, any given point per second. And lots of projects and companies building on matrix. And most interestingly, in some ways, turns out the government really like matrix. 
because it's end-to-end -end encrypted and it's decentralized and it's open source and it's an open standard. So the entirety of the French state has adopted Matrix as its communication platform um, rather than everybody using WhatsApp and Telegram, which is what they did before. And day before yesterday, the Bundeswehr in Germany, the armed forces, announced their um, matrix deployment. So that's the entirety of the German military using matrix for coordination and communication. Um, also, all the schools in Schleswig-Holstein and Hamburg in Germany have gone on board and a couple of uh, the other German lander. And there are a bunch of other governments, some of which we haven't announced yet, um, who are in the middle of implementing matrix as their kind of public sector backbone. So frankly, this was the last thing we expected when we created it. We thought the matrix was a bit of a anarchic you know, for the PSTN, uh, replace email, bring back communication people um, play rather than something that governments would adopt. But it turns out that it's good both for the citizens and the governments. So it's one of the ways as element that we keep matrix funded by doing consulting for them. So if anybody hypothetically here were to work for any uh, local governments and um, want uh, to roll out matrix, please come and talk to me with my element hat on. So I wanted to talk um, specifically today about the future a bit, and I've waffled on too much, so I've got precisely 16 minutes to tell the future of Matrix. We've been doing a lot of work on peer-to-peer, -peer, and the idea is that we want users to be able to have control over their data without being systems, and also much easier onboarding. We don't want users to have to pick a server in order to um, uh, install Element, because it really confuses people. They're just not used to it. It would be really fun to support mesh networks and internetless operation. Um, at the moment, the servers act as uh, quite a repository of metadata. So a good way to protect metadata is to get rid of the servers and have the only copy of the data and the metadata to be on your phone or your browser or your app. Um, it also would force us um, to do better client-side bridging, which is quite desirable because people like WhatsApp um, probably don't want us running big server-side bridges to WhatsApp. But if you as a user choose to run one on your local server on your phone, then it's your problem and it's not ours. And it also forces us to solve a lot of hard problems. It, it forces us to do portable identity so that you can share your same matrix identity between, say, your phone and your tablet and your browser. Um, forces us to make home servers which fit on embedded devices and edge devices means that we need better routing algorithms because right now matrix is full mesh routing every time i send a message it does a thousand parallel http hits to every other server in that room or two if there are two servers in the room and that's obviously going to be horrible on a phone in terms of radio usage and battery life if every time i send a message it literally has to try to connect to every other endpoint every other phone in the room so we have to do some smarter routing going on there and we don't want to waste bandwidth. We have to do better than HTTP um, for low bandwidth transports. But the best thing about it is that the clients and the bots and the bridges stay absolutely the same. They just happen to connect to a server that runs locally rather than one that is running in a data center somewhere. So all the features that you get in, say, Element today, the VoIP, the encryption, file transfer, read receipts, all that stuff, you just get it completely for free. Oh, I could talk through the story of how we got here, but we don't have time. There is a complicated diagram, which I will skip over. So we've been doing this with um, experiments over the last um, year, basically. And the first one was to take Dendrite, which is our Go server. And here's a diagram of Dendrite. And you have basically microservices, all of which scale um, up horizontally. So you can have multiple client APIs to receive messages, multiple sync APIs to send messages. And then you've got the room server that actually models rooms. And then you've got federation senders for sending messages, blah, blah, blah. Um, basically, this guy can either scale massively wide in a data center or you can squidge it all down into one binary, we call it a monolith, and run it client side. It's about 20 megabytes of WebAssembly if you're running it in a browser, or about 18 megabytes of native code because Go is quite big because uh, it's all statically linked. Um, but this is what we've been playing with as our test base for embedding servers into clients. So we thought, what would happen if we swapped the HTTP transport, first of all, for libptp, which is this library for doing peer-to-peer, -peer, as you can probably guess, built by the IPFS guys. And it gives you 
HT for discovery. It gives you pub sub semantics and it gives you arbitrary transports on the network and lots of different implementations. And what we did was to put HTTP layered over libp2p to see how well it worked. So beforehand, you had a browser with element now or well, right now element in it, talking HTTP to a server like Synapse, talks to Postgres, talks HTTP to another server and up to the browser. After P2P, um, what we did was to get to a local dendrite running over HTTPS, and this would still talk to Postgres and go over the network. And it actually worked very, very well. Um, LibP2P has some quirks, shall we say, but as a first proof of concept, it gave us confidence that we were on the right track. So the next step was, hey, what would happen if we put Dendrite in a browser rather than doing it as native code? So we compiled it down to WebAssembly and then implemented a special HTTP transport that would funnel the HTTP traffic through the web browser. And then we had did a special um, SQL um, driver that would store your SQL. It will basically no longer use Postgres because you're not going to put Postgres in a web browser, obviously, I hope. But instead, um, take the SQL and funnel it through from the Go layer into JavaScript and back it by SQL, SQL.js, which is effectively SQL-like compiled to WebAssembly. And then you put it all in a web service worker and you talk HTTP to it because service workers are this lovely bit of the web spec, which um, allows you to basically intercept outbound HTTP and service it by JavaScript or WebAssembly locally rather than it actually hitting the network. So it looks like this. You have a browser with the same old element web, right web in it that talks through to a service worker. And then you have a SQLite implementation and the HTTP brew. And you need to rendezvous via some kind of discovery service. And uh, libp2p gives you this rendezvous protocol. But having discovered who you want to talk to, you can then talk um, web sockets via the rendezvous server, or you can talk peer-to-peer -peer WebRTC, at which point you are going completely peer-to-peer -peer between the browsers with this um, server running in Go and WebAssembly locally, which is, I think, pretty cool. And again, it works. I don't have time to show this one. I'm going to show one of the demos, though. Um, and this actually took us through in this kind of architecture uh, where we were going from client server to um, having a daemon to having it embedded in the client, um, but then, uh, and it's actually going all the way through to having Dendrite and JS lib P2P. So we're kind of done all the various different permutations of server to server to peer to peer by that point. As the third one, we wanted to try a totally different peer to peer transport, um, a system called Igdradzil. Um, this is a really cool project. It's a peer to peer overlay network, which forms a spanning tree over the whole network. It doesn't use the spanning tree for sending uh, data, this is it for um, identity and also for making routing decisions. And it routes um, packets via, uh, well, it re makes routing decisions using the node which is closest based on the spanning tree coordinates. So the packets aren't going over the spanning tree itself, they're just using it as a coordinate system. And it physically looks like that. Um, and in fact, we can go look at the real one right now. Um, if I go to say, igdranzil-map.cw.org, this is a live map of the Igdranzil network. And if I click somewhere at the middle, it will hopefully go and color it in nicely. And one can see the coordinates and the IP addresses of the nodes which are participating in the public overlay network. So the some of the really nice properties you have here is that it uses any network available. Um, so this is, it could obviously be over IP, but it could also be over a local mesh. It could be over Bluetooth. It could be over ad hoc Wi-Fi of some kind. And if a set of nodes split from the internet, the overlay still works locally for that partition of the network. So you have network partition tolerance built into the overlay network itself out of the box. Um, it doesn't um, do onion routing or anything, um, but it does end-to-end -end encrypt the data. And it's basically a anonymous IPv6 overlay network, which you can use as a great big shared VPN for people to connect together and tunnel, tunnel through NAT, tunnel through air gaps or bad air gap networks, et cetera, in order to get everybody on the same page. So it's really quite nice um, as a peer-to-peer -peer overlay. 
And what we did was to take the Go implementation, and this time we put it inside Dendry as native code, running it on OS. And it looks a bit like this. Um, let me um, try sharing my screen on my iPhone. Hopefully this will work. It worked a minute ago. Wait for AirPlay to do its thing. All right, welcome to my um, iPhone. Hopefully people can see that with my COVID tracing app. And if I go here to Element P2P, this is for build development, which is, you can see at the top, in actions by, by here. Now, one of the interesting things about Excel is that you have to specify a specific pins um, to go and to. Now, you can discover these via multicast DNS, um, or you could discover them via um, um, static peers, or you can discover them by whatever discovery mechanism. Um, in this instance, there's nobody else on my LAN on this. So I have manually gone and added a static peer here. And um, Ixrantel actually maintains a list of static peers. Um, if I click the Find Public Peers button, it will go and bring up a list. And I have gone and picked one. This one, second one here in the Netherlands. Um, so that is what I'm connected to. And that will literally be one of these nodes on the network here, if I can probably search it, in fact. And uh, well, I, I can't you just have to <laughs> believe me. Now I've gone. Uh, oh, now I'm not connected to it at all, which is a bad sign. And this is a little bit beta. I hasten to add. So let me just quickly kill the app and go back in um, uh, to give it the biggest chance of success. Okay, no connections by one peer. Now this room here is me and Amandine, my co-founder, testing this um, on and off. And I can say anyone home. And if we go and click through on myself here and look at my metrics ID, it's got this horrible host name, which is a big um, hash, which is my public key on the Eggdransel network. So normally in matrix, this would be like at Matthew, go on matrix.org. But here we're not using DNS. We're discovering people by looking at the DHT that looks at public keys um, out there on the um, public um, network. And as of 23 minutes past seven, at least this was working great. And I was able to talk to Amandine and I had read receipts. Um, she is locked down in her um, particular bit of London. And if I go back, I have one connection by one peer. And if I say, hello, hopefully she might be out there. Let's find out. Of course, all the best demos don't work. Uh, well, as I said, it's um, still relatively beta. And one of the big problems we have here is that the network can change quite a lot, obviously, because it's constantly calculating the spanning tree and the paths can come and go. And they're quite um, ad hoc um, one way or another. And quick, which is the transport that we're using on top of it, um, it typically, oh, there we go. Thank God for that. <sighs> Live demo is actually working. Um, let me just say something about typing motifs and everything. So there you go. That is real live pit of matrix traffic happening. Well, I have the third changes um, has to start, and by the default, that's locked out, and it quite picked up with the amount of traffic that's going back and forth. So that is a quick demo of um, what's um, going on. Um, with that type of peer-to-peer -peer matrix. But wait, there is more. Um, let me go back to my slides. One of the nice things is that we get ADL here, which is um, the thing that AirDrop uses on Apple devices. So you don't even need to be on the same network. AWDL works by to discover other people within other Bluetooth beacons. And then it negotiates an ad hoc Wi-Fi network without your permission on the fly between the devices. So it literally uses an unclaimed um, chunk of 802.11 um, radio space and uh, creates a peer-to-peer -peer ad hoc Wi-Fi network just transparently. And so you literally can create a Wi-Fi mesh without having to do anything which is particularly cool. 
um, and it supports the lossless notification, uh, the network partition tolerance, and we're using Quick, as I mentioned. But one of the disadvantages is that we haven't compiled it to WebAssembly yet, so it's not running in browser. And it is very experimental, and it doesn't necessarily help us with the fan out routing. Um, uh, so at the moment, that traffic was still going full mesh to everybody. Now, I say it doesn't necessarily help us with the routing because you no, know, uh, there's lots of fun things uh, we could um, do um, to leverage the spanning tree and the underlying network topology to also provide smarter routing algorithms. And if we ran this in the browser, we could basically include these peer-to-peer -peer nodes alongside today's server-side home servers and create a hybrid network where the servers themselves are participating in peer-to-peer. -peer. So if you want to have peer-to-peer -peer on a handset, you could, but also the server would be a gateway into today's matrix network too. So a new experiment, you know, I completely forgot to actually give the details of the new experiment. Well, the new experiment I'll talk to you about instead is called Pinecone. And it's um, not something we've officially announced yet, but it's written by one of the developers of Yggdrasil, who now actually works for Element on Matrix stuff. And it is taking Yggdrasil to the next level, basically based on a lot of the lessons with Yggdrasil. And one of the big changes is that Yggdrasil is a greedy rooted system when you send a packet every new hop goes and recalculates what the next best hop is, which is all very well and good. But if the network is changing from under you and the network path changes, um, it, you have to time out and it can be quite painful to reconverge again. Whereas uh, uh, Pinecone also has support for source routing. So you can calculate the route through the network at the origin node. And then even if the intermediary hops might have issues on along the way uh, you can almost alternate between greedy routing and source routing in order to try to get best of both worlds it also um, is designed for application layer um, topologies and um, it's not an ip v6 overlay like Yggdrasil. instead it's very much geared up for routing http traffic or similar quick traffic actually um, for matrix so we're hoping that this might end up being the final peer-to-peer -peer overlay that we use for Matrix. Um, I, as I said, I've got slides for this bit, so I apologize. Um, but if I go to Hank and Dev on Neil Alexander, you can see that um, Neil, who's the developer in question, is running a simulation on the Cloud Summit. This has got 261 nodes on it. And what it's done is to define a spanning tree over them. In fact, if you look carefully, you might recognize these look like AS numbers, a mix of negative wraparound ASs. I think is using a AS data set that is used for simulating the internet, basically. And it's got his 261 ASs. A route will have been assigned to it, and then they will have coordinates within the resulting spanning tree and it's basically simulating traffic going around the place looking at the path lengths through the tree the convergence where the route is apparently it is node ff35 wherever that guy is and so on and so forth so lots of really fun r d and if you know what a stretch is of the network apparently our stretch currently is 1.05 for being able to route through this peer-to-peer -peer overlay so I think you're the first people in the world who actually have been told what Pinecone is. And so this might be the shape of things um, to come. All right, I have two minutes left to get through an awful lot of stuff. I'm going to start talking very quickly indeed. Um, so path forwards, uh, we want to look at the P2P gossip stuff. We need portable accounts. Uh, we need to store them forward. At the moment, the, the nodes have to be online at the same time, which obviously sucks. Um, we want to use current rather than quick, and we need better routing, blah, blah, blah. Two other things I want to talk about. Spaces. This is also something the world has never seen before. Um, spaces, the final frontier, is the ability to group together arbitrary sets of rooms, including hierarchies of rooms, and you can use it for communities or workspaces or lists of rooms. You can also set permissions based on membership of these spaces, and you can do things like auto-join users based on space membership. We have wireframes, and this is not designed. This is literal, you know, sketch is of how the UI will work for this in Element. But it's things like, do you want to create a new space? Is it a list or a workspace or a community? If it's a list, you 
give it a name and you add rooms to it. If it's a workspace, you give it a name and you invite people to it. If it's a community, you give it a name and you add rooms to it. So it's um, really trying to flesh out the ability to basically have hierarchies of rooms in grouped into spaces in the left panel in Element. So for your marketing agency, for instance, that is a space. You click on marketing agency and the whole thing will be branded as your marketing agency. And within that, you have subspaces with the London office and the secret project and the New York office, no, not so secret project, etc. Again, don't look at the visuals. This is purely the wireframe to give an idea of roughly what we're thinking of. I uh, minus 10 seconds left. Finally, threading, something that has been missing from Matrix for the last six years, and we've been making good progress in the last month or two on it. This is Matrix Spec Change 2836. It's very experimental, but it provides arbitrary depth, um, arbitrary nestedness, um, uh, arbitrary bushiness threading. Even more interestingly, it supports cross-room threads, which allows you to link together um, user timelines, for instance. So I could have a timeline room for myself and somebody else might have another one. And if we send messages between our respective timelines, like you can on Twitter, for instance, you need to be able to stitch them into a thread, even though there isn't a room in common. So we support this ability for me to send, post a message to my timeline that is referencing someone else and bounce back and forth. Whole new API called um, event relationships, I think, which allows you to walk this tree of messages, depth first or breadth first, et cetera. Um, UX wise, we're looking at both Twitter or Facebook style vertical threading, where all the replies go in a column and then if it forks, it kind of indents, as well as horizontal threading like Hacker News or Reddit or Slashdot, where you every reply is indented, a bit like an email thread, and then when there's different fork, it kind of unindents. Uh, we have a proof of concept client called Cerulean, which is a um, very much just a proof of concept for threading. We deliberately didn't do it in Element because the data models and everything are completely different. And in fact, Cerulean looks and smells suspiciously like Twitter as an example of how you could do something that isn't instant messaging on top of Matrix. And server side, we've used Dendrite as our test bed for it, just like we use Dendrite for all of our weird experimental stuff. And it looks like this. And I think you are the second people in the world um, to see it, if I can find it. Here is Cerulean. So this is me between Alice and Bob. I'm logged in as Alice um, on a Dendrite running here as local host. And if I alt tab to it, then yeah, there sure enough is my Dendrite sitting here. And you can see me syncing as Alice on local host. And I can do some fun things. I can switch between vertical threading view and horizontal view. You can see in horizontal view, it kind of indents, as I said, like email or hacker news. And then vertical view, it draws it a bit like you get on Twitter, et cetera. And I can click through to the permalinks here. So there's the awesome message. I can go back. I can go up to the parent. I can keep going like that. And you can see all my crappy test messages as I've been going and playing, um, talking with myself. And I could go and reply to a message. Bob says, more threads. I say, even more threads. And send it. And hey, presto, I've gone and created this vertical thread. Vertical. You can imagine that other people might be talking to me on this, etc. And something I haven't tried, actually. Try, I'll try going completely off um, message and see if I've got a element running here. I normally have one. Oh, I don't. Uh, let me just go and set an element running. Wait one second. I'll go into my uh, workspace to vector web because I've never got around to renaming it as element. It used to be called vector, and I will yarn start it. Um, so vector, as I mentioned, is written in TypeScript, and so we just need to wait a minute for Webpack to go through chewing all my CPU, building out um, my local uh, copy of element web. It should be there in a second, and it will be available on port 8080. Yeah, so at least I've got a listener there now. 90% chunk asset processing, reticulating splines. And compiled successfully, here is element. So if I sign into my local matrix server, not matrix.org, but my dendrite, which I think is probably running on port 8008. And I'm called Alice, and I have no idea what password I used for Alice. Uh, it's going to be annoying. 
Uh, perhaps I can just, I'll just create a new account. I'll call it Matthew imaginatively. Ugh. Oh, this is going well. Okay, let me try logging in as Matthew instead. Uh, no. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, now I'm getting rate limited. <laughs> Even better. Um, let me to create a test account instead. Ah, uh, seriously, create account. Test. Right. Brilliant. Painless. Now here on normal matrix client, I. If I could look at the room directory, okay, there's just me randomly testing in there. But if I think I, if I go to Alice on localhost, so it's a room which is basically named after Alice. In theory, yeah, you can see the actual matrix room that represents Alice's timeline. So you can see me as Alice saying, even more threads, vertical threads there. And then the test user mysteriously joins the room. And if we look at who else is in the room, you'll see that Bob is in the room too, because Alice and Bob were having that conversation. So if Element was thread aware, we would be able to take these messages and then expand them out just like Sarah Lynn. Instead, um, if I put them side by side, at the moment, we're just stuck with being able to see one side of the conversation. I say, look, it's over matrix. Then, hey, presto, Alice sends that message. Look, it's over matrix. And with a thread aware client, it would be properly threaded here. It's just linear in the room. So I apologize for running over by six minutes from my allocated slot. But that is basically what I wanted to say about threading. And there is Sarah Leon. And thank you very much. Any questions on any of that? Or have I just bored everybody to tears? Ominous silence. Have you ever heard about the worldwide conferencing network? The worldwide conferencing network? Yes, WWCN. I no, I haven't. Oh. Okay. That surprises me, though, because it sounds like something I would know about. What is it? It's, it's Matrix, basically, but then uh -huh. from back in the 1990s. Ah, oh, was it related to see you see me, or no. oh, or was it one of the M bone based? No, it was a, re a really a, a very alpha based attempt to fix IRC in a more uh, expanded way. But it sort of failed when the creator of it took up a job instead of having fun. <laughs> Well, the secret is to find a way to make uh, your job <laughs> the, your fun hobby, I guess. Um, but yeah, it sounds really interesting. I mean, I'm familiar with a lot of people who've tried to solve this before, like um, uh, uh, Psych. If anybody came across Psych, P S Y C, as a um, uh, I think German originated IRC replacement that is quite similar to Matrix, but actually went further than Matrix in that each node had its own Turing complete um state machine uh so you could basically build arbitrary logic into the network so it was fully decentralized like matrix but in matrix we deliberately constrained the things you can do in rooms to something that has got um or well, something that is mp complete it's always a good thing and um, something that isn't going to consume arbitrary resources whereas he just went crazy and said hey i can basically put a lisp or fourth scripting language into the fabric of my room and all the messages become code and all the code becomes messages and it all becomes very meta um, you, know, uh, you have a blockchain and, and, and currency in there <laughs> yeah no ironically it is really quite close to an ethereum style um evm approach or one of these um, blockchain things, except that was 20 years ago. So if yeah, if it thought of putting a cryptocurrency on top of it, then it probably would be a very rich guy or rich in terms of special fake money. I have a question. Yeah. Would the Android app ever be able to have more than one account? Very good question. Uh, Multi-account is a really awkward, irritating one because we had it before Element. So before Riot and Vector, our reference client was called Console, and it was our like 
initial first ever client and we went and put in multi-account and it was great. And then we re-implemented everything for Vector, which became Riot, which became Element. And for whatever reason, we just still haven't got around to it yet. Um, I think the, one of the big problems is adding end-to-end -end encryption, which is really hard to make work in a decentralized environment. And frankly, I'm almost wondering, uh, I think it was the right thing to do, but it's almost destroyed the project in terms of the amount of effort that goes into um, hunting obscure bugs and usability problems that have come out of end-to-end -end encryption. Now, helping users not lose their keys, helping users verify each other. Um, what do you do if there's a network partition and you just don't know who's on the other side of the network? How do you encrypt for somebody who doesn't know, who you don't know exists? All this sort of nightmare. And as a result, we haven't got around to doing multi-account. The good news is that uh, Raya X, which became Element Android, was built with it in mind. So architecturally, you have that abstraction underneath. And also, we've almost added it on Element Web. Element iOS already had it left over from console. So in theory, it's just UX to go and put a bunch of toggles and settings and separate all flows. And what we used to do was to have a little dog ear on the top left of every room that told you which account it was. And we would treat it effectively like spaces, which I just showed you. So on the far left, you'd have icons to switch between accounts. But I'm afraid right now it is still science fiction. But trust me, it's something that we would very, very, very much want. And it was really nice when we had it. And it's a bit embarrassing that we don't. So I apologize. OK, thank you. What other questions? Um, in your demo on the, on the phone, you sent some messages. And I noticed that it said uh, unencrypted in the, in the typing screen. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is it encrypted? Is it not? Or uh, what does what does that mean? In that instance, it was saying, let me just check. I think it was just saying that it was um, not end-to-end -end encrypted. Yeah, uh, an unencrypted room um, because I just didn't turn on encryption in that room. OK, it's just, uh, just a toggle for, for the user. Um, so when you create um, any private room like a direct message or a invite only room it will default to being end-to-end -end encrypted um but uh i think that the peer-to-peer -peer client predates us actually turning it on or we forks it before we turned it on by default um so nowadays you get it by default but um honestly it scares people and it confuses them because they say unencrypted oh shouldn't you? well you're sending it all in plain text no, obviously everything here is TLS, um, HTTPS traffic, et cetera. But um, the question is whether it's end-to-end -end encrypted. And it's worth noting in a peer-to-peer -peer model, where there aren't any store and forward nodes or intermediary nodes, end-to-end -end encryption is pointless because TLS is end-to-end -end encrypted if there isn't any intermediary, which is another reason to wonder whether all well, that work spent on end-to-end -end encryption was a waste of time if we end up going entirely peer-to-peer -peer in future. Okay. Um, do you have recommendations for if you want to set up a server, to which which one to go to? Just that for now, use Synapse. It's stable. It's out of beta. Um, it's nowadays horizontally scalable if you need it to. But honestly, it's good for at least hundreds, if not thousands, of users um, without um, needing to worry too much about scaling. Um, the disadvantage is that it uses a lot of RAM. Uh, we made it go fast by bluntly adding memory caches on the database. And by default, it will use at least a few gigabytes of RAM. You can tune that down or you can tune it up. Um, whereas on Dendrite, we went to the other model and we just made the database go fast. And we use sensible schemas and sensible database queries. And we have not yet added any um, caching in memory at all. And as a result, um, it goes much faster than Synapse. But it is beta. And if you're feeling ex if you're feeling adventurous, and sure, play with it. Um, but most people use it as a secondary server for experimentation, and they use the Synapse for their boring um, business as usual. And lots of people complain bitterly about Synapse using lots of RAM. But it's worth noting that this isn't XMPP or SMTP. It's not a message passing system. It is a conversation synchronization system. It feels more like a 
you know, distributed file system or feels like more like NNTP. And just as you would not be surprised, perhaps that an IMAP server or an NNTP server might use lots of RAM because it's caching lots of history, same with Synapse, but it's very different to a Java server. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, wow, big, big question came in on the public chat. Typing is microphone is noisy. For me, Matrix would be yet another messaging app, as I'm already on too many. It would be great if it could replace combine the others. Using bridging, that is possible, but it's cumbersome. Uh, rooms to set up as multi-user rooms, and I believe you need to make separate rooms with just yourself and the bridge bot in it for every other chat service you want to be on. This is not the case, luckily. Having an easy setup to plug other messaging services into Matrix would be a nice selling point. So in combination with a privately used Matrix server. So first of all, I mean, some of that is right in that bridging isn't as easy and it is relatively cumbersome relative to what it could be. However, you absolutely don't need to do um, special things um, uh, like create special rooms for separate bridge bots. Um, ideally, it's pretty transparent. Let me go and uh, grab my actual matrix client here and I'll attempt to demonstrate. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Right, so here is my personal um, element, and I'm in about 2,000, uh, actually 3,000 rooms here. Um, I'm in way too many DMs and way too many rooms um, because of, I guess, having been there from the beginning. And here is Matrix HQ, which is one of our big rooms with 1,000 people in it, and people asking about how the encryption works and typing away and you have your read receipts down the right hand side etc if i wanted to bridge this um somewhere i have to add bridges and i would pray that it's up and as it happens this has already been bridged to slack and get a, an irc and if i go and add a new one i don't oh no i could also add an additional one to say irc or Slack or Gitter, we could bridge it somewhere else. So I could say, hey, I want to add an IRC bridge and I want to add it to somewhere on, I know, Freenode and I want to add it to this channel, blah, 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 blah. Um, in order to bridge to IRC, you need the permission of somebody on the remote side um, to make sure that they do actually want 7,000 bots to flood into their room in order to bridge this big room or matrix into them. So you have to get permission from that channel who gets DM'd and they will say yes or no. And that's how it works. Now, if it's a more exotic um, uh, protocol than Slack or Gitter or IRC, um, so I don't know, WhatsApp, say, um, it is a little bit cumbersome right now. On my personal account, I do run a WhatsApp bridge and they're you basically have to run it as a separate daemon and you have to chat to it as if it were a bot and all this sort of thing. Um, but uh, there is an MSC, um, there's always an MSC, it's kind of a running joke. I think it's um, 2358 from memory. Find out. No, I misremembered it. Let's go to the matrix uh, docs back proposals, which uh, they all live. And I go down here, look for bridging stuff. Ah. 2346, not 2358, my bad. And if we look at this one, um, come on, GitHub. So these all equate to us against our document repository. And I've been able to review this poor pull request, and it's just over a year old, so I'm a bad person. It's even been implemented on Element and Slack and the ILC bridge. And if we look at the format of these things, it is literally saying many rooms on Matrix are currently bridged, but you don't have a way to determine which networks are bridged into which room. And here is the proposal to put nice metadata and nice user interface so that you can very easily see who is bridged where and provision that easily in a consistent way. Here are examples for XMPP and GitHub and Mastodon and anything else. So it's very close. We just need to um, hook it up. But totally agreed that bridging could be a uh, much better than it is but you know matrix is a free network and there are other people um than element building on it and one example is a cool outfit called nova chat which is actually done by a guy called eric nigikovsky 
um, who is more, more famous for being CEO of Pebble, if you like your smartwatches. And nowadays, he's a Matrix fan, and he has built this Matrix app and this Matrix offering called Nova Chat. And as you can see, it's a desktop chat client that aggregates all your chats into one app, and it supports all of the consumer things like Facebook and Slack and WhatsApp and Telegram, et cetera. And it has a really simple um, play interface. And if you look carefully, you can see you've got a Facebook Messenger icon and a Slack icon. And it, you know, it's a matrix client that does nothing but bridging. So in some ways, it's just element sucking that this isn't exposed as nicely as it could be, um, because Nova Chat shows that it can be done well. There is a catch, which is that Nova Chat is not open source, but um, at least it shows it can be done on matrix. So I hope that answered your question, Walter. And um, cool. Right, any other questions? Looks like we might be towards an end then. Okay, well, I hope it was interesting yep. to hear about Matrix. And um, I do ask people to please consider running a Matrix server and give us feedback, um, file bugs, tell us which bits of elements suck the most and which features you want the most, like multi-account particularly. Go and upvote the multi-account issue on GitHub if you happen to be. And, um, uh, tell your friends, and please, uh, we basically need all the support we can get to make this thing successful. And obviously, we hope that it will end up replacing email and the phone network rather than being IRC Mark II or Mark III or IV or whatever we're on now. But um, thank you for listening to me waffle on, and I hope it was interesting. And thanks for having me on. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Good to meet you.